So guys, uh, just before you leave us, I want to go through a quick, uh, quick fire round of some of the key birding questions that, that maybe people back uh, watching are interested in. So I'm going to go, um, let's start with Rich and then George, and you can just each answer back to back very quickly and we'll go through the questions. Okay. So to start off with, um, favorite bird? Uh, Eleonora's falcon from the Mediterranean. That's a good one. I, I say blue jay. Blue jay is my favorite. Blue jay. Okay. Uh, nemesis bird. You know, I don't have a particular one that I've been going after, uh, so I, I, I don't really have one for that, that question. Okay, George? I got one. Rufus Vented Ground Cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> I'll trade you mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's mine as well, one of many. 8x42 um, or 10 by 42 I definitely think 10. I feel like that extra push over the edge is worth it. I'm in the same boat. Ten, always, always been a 10 guy. Okay, I think Diego and I are both in the eight camp, interestingly. This could be a whole other episode, I think. This could be a whole other episode. <laughs> Let's um, compromise on nine. How about that? Nine. Okay, we'll stick with nine by 42. Um, or I could have said 12. Do you know anybody oh. who birds with 12? I yeah, I birded with 12s for a while, but then pelagic trips and like trying to do like mm -hmm. morning flight songbirds, I would miss them. And I just was like, all right, I got to go back to 10, scale back. So I've been 10s ever since. Now 12 is getting more popular again after Swarovski got the new Pures, you know, they do 12 with a huge field of view. 12 is going to get popular. It's kind of weird, weird shit. Yeah. Well, this is definitely a whole other episode. We'll have to have some experts on from optics companies. Right. Next question. Um, photography or not on tour? For me or for the clients? <laughs> Ooh, good. For you as a guide, do you, do you take photos on tour or yeah, not? Yeah, no, I, I think um, this is going to be more than A and B, I'm sorry, but the... Uh, uh, Sometimes it's good to get people who are interested in photography, but it doesn't become the thing where they're standing in front of other people and so forth. So there's a balance there with the clients. As far as me, I I, uh, I would say no, except if there's a chance to have photos to do a, a slideshow presentation at the end, or if you're on a ship trip and you can put photos up at the recap of what happened that day, then I think it's very valuable. Yeah. Okay, George, uh, same question to you. Photography or no? I'm pro photography as long as it doesn't uh, disrupt the birding and and people don't get in each other's way. So, and personally as a guide, I like to take pictures. I try to do it after everyone is sort of absorbing the sighting. You know, you never you never lead as a guide with your camera. It's, uh, you know, let everyone, in, they're there to enjoy the stuff. So enjoy enjoy the birds. And then if you get some pictures, so be it. Yeah, it would be bad form for the guide to elbow the clients out of the way to get the photo. I've seen it happen, <laughs> but uh, I've yes. Seen it. I've seen it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Rich, um, best non bird wildlife encounter? Oh, I had a jaguar sighting, my only jaguar sighting in uh, the Amazon when I was working at Manu, and it was in the early evening. Uh, we'd go out and follow the army ant swarms and see where they're going. They'd always move kind of as dusk arrived. So I'd gone out, I'd followed them to their new bivouac, I flagged it, and I was going back to take the flagging down, and there was some eye shine in my, in my little headlamp. And I always kept a really big, bright torch ready for these moments, you know, which luckily had batteries. And so I see this thing coming towards me, and I thought it looked like kind of a possum, the way it was sort of, you know, loping along. And I flashed the light on, and it was a jaguar. And it was maybe 20 feet away, and it turned and sat sideways, kind of like cats do, disinterested, you know, sort of like this, like not looking at me. <laughs> It walked away, and then I heard a stick crack on the other side. I turned my flashlight that way, and there he is again, again, doing the disinterested cat thing like this. <laughs> so after three or four minutes, I was like, okay, I'm ready for this sighting to end now because I'm by myself <laughs> in the dark, like two miles from, from my camp. So I slapped my leg thinking it's going to scare the uh, jaguar away, and he, that was the only time he looked at me. He turned and gave me this look like, who the hell do you think I am? <laughs> <laughs> so I just backed off and left him. So that's my story. And so, George, same to you. Best, best non non bird wildlife encounter. I'm, I'm going to go with cats as well. I, uh, you know, there's there's probably nothing that thrills me more than seeing wild cat. Uh, not particularly rare, but seeing four ocelots in one day once in the Llanos of Venezuela uh, at Hato Pinero. I know an area you know well, Chris, uh, the, the in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. um, that was a an incredible thrill, and I just the the kind of the the key one was we were we were in our truck, stopped, listening, looking for birds, and we just w had this ocelot. The sun was coming from behind us, and they just walked right up to us until it was, I don't know, 
a hundred feet away. It was amazing. And we had three others that day. So that, that was a pretty special day. Let me get in. Let me get in and change the subject and talk to you about my Jaguar. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm, you know, I'm going to go for bio, bioluminescent plankton. Ooh. It's one of the times I have cried more doing something and watching something in nature. Jaguar yeah. made me cry, my first Jaguar, but bioluminescent plankton and bioluminescent fungi are just mind-blowing. Yep. I hear you. Very cool. And yeah, the ocelot thing, I remember having three ocelots, I think, in one night spotlighting it at the same hato in Venezuela like 10 years ago. <laughs> it's a pretty remarkable place. Um, okay, um, and, w and one final question. Uh, Rich, start with you. And I think I know the answer to this question. Bird fast or bird slow? Oh, slow. You mean the pace, <laughs> of, the pace of the walk? Is that what we're getting at? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some birders who, who like to really take their time and cover 200 yards in about seven hours. And there are some who are purposeful, striding ahead, trying to get around every corner. You know, I'm probably the latter, to be honest, but I yeah. don't know about you. Yeah, I'm. well, as I mentioned earlier, when I was doing the leisurely walks for Zagram Expeditions, and uh, it is as slow as you get. And I, I like that challenge, you know, like the kind of the more you look, the more you see. And along those lines, uh, a recommendation for your for your audience, I um, I find that I find more things when, like say, if I'm taking a walk, with even with a group, and I say, you know what, I'm going to catch up, I'm going to just stay back and take a leak. Those two minutes of stopping, like just stopping for a second, you don't always have to take a leak, but I recommend stopping. And it's just amazing <laughs> how things start to get back to normal. You know, the birds, the squirrels, the chipmunks, everything just start to not be so alarmed anymore, and they go back to their business. So I've seen some some great things just by stopping and taking a leak. So, George, same question to you. Are you a fast birder or a slow birder? I'd say it kind of depends. But overall, if I have my druthers, I prefer to take my time. I like my favorite thing around here locally when I'm out is to take a long, slow stroll and see what appears. Pick a nice patch and work it to death. That's what I like to do. Mm -hmm.